Two million square miles of rock-bound wilderness. That was the barrier that confronted the early explorers. They didn't waste much time adapting to the Indian canoe in their conquest of the land. And 300 years later, it's still the best way of getting around out here. Rapids and falls still bar the way to this hidden world, but they are no longer an obstruction to be cursed as they were in the days of the voyageur. It is because of the rapids and falls that these hidden places exist today, cut off from the modern world. It doesn't cost all that much to be here, but wilderness travel can be difficult, and there are risks. 
Running rapids will always be a calculated risk. But risk diminishes with skill and knowledge. Canoeists, not the river, decide the course of the canoe. By doing an eddy turn into the still water behind a rock, they buy time to appraise the water ahead and plan strategy, just one of the many maneuvers that make the running of rapids under control possible. When you ride a wild river, there's a sense of freedom that has almost been forgotten from our distant past. You become a part of your canoe, a part of the land, and a part of all that has gone before. The art of canoeing has come down to us through the centuries from the native peoples, each generation adding to the skill of the last. Even today, paddling techniques are still improving. Paddling does not come naturally. Like any skill, it must be learned. The first problem to overcome is the tendency of the canoe to veer away from the stern paddler's side. It's the stern paddler's job to correct this without losing power in the stroke. The bow paddler mainly supplies power. The strength of the stroke comes through the use of the whole body. The paddle is brought back flat to cut wind resistance. A short stroke is more efficient than a long one. There are three basic strokes for paddling a straight line. First, the J-stroke. At the end of the stroke, the power face of the paddle, which is the side that pulls against the water, turns out. Without instruction, most people pry with the wrong side of the paddle. They turn the power face in towards the canoe and pry out. This is called the stern pry or goon stroke and is inefficient for paddling a straight line. To do the J properly, roll the power face out and pry away. The power face turns out, away from the canoe. If you're doing it right, the thumb on the upper hand will point down at the end of the stroke. With the J, the steering action takes place at the end of the stroke. To do the Canadian stroke, roll the power face out, knife the paddle back underwater, and pull up. The force exerted upwards as the paddle knifes forward provides the steering action. With the Canadian stroke, the steering takes place during the recovery. It's a relaxing and beautiful stroke. The third steering stroke is called the pitch. The rolling out of the power face begins early, with the paddle leaving the water at the end of the power stroke. pitch stroke, the steering is accomplished during the power stroke. It's a fast, efficient stroke, though not as relaxing as the Canadian.
when any one of these strokes is applied with extra force on the push or pry away, the canoe turns toward the stern paddler's side. The bow paddler can assist in the turn by shortening his power stroke and doing a pry off the gunnel. away from the stern paddler's side, a sweep is used. The bow does a diagonal draw. Reaching out at 45 degrees, the paddle is drawn towards the body, pulling the canoe around into the turn. To turn even sharper, reach out to 90 degrees and draw straight towards the body. By working together as a team, the canoe can be moved aggressively into tight turns without slowing down. If the bow and stern paddlers both do a draw stroke or a pry stroke, the canoe will rotate at a point halfway between the two canoeists. It's called the pivot point. To pivot towards the bowman's side, both paddlers do a draw. Sculling draw accomplishes the same thing, but with the paddle remaining in the water, the stroke is more stable. The paddle is knifed back and forth, angled against the water. To pivot in the opposite direction, both paddlers do the pry. The stroke for the bow paddler is to do a cross draw. After mastering the stationary pivots, they are then attempted when moving. First, the pry. The most difficult part of the pry turn is getting just the right angle on the paddle and bracing against the gunnel. The pry turn can be used for a violent turn into an eddy. When making a landing, the pry is delayed as long as possible, so the canoe completes the turn close to shore. The power turn towards the bow paddler's side. As momentum slows, follow with a series of draws. The stern does a sweep. The bow draw pivot is the safest stroke for making a turn into an eddy behind a rock. bow draw landing. Hey, I don't like the look of that. Okay, take it to shore. The bow draw pivot above a rapid is a fast way to get to shore. The upstream paddler gets out first and holds. The alternative to the pry turn is the cross bow draw. The stern does a pry. The 
cross draw is safer than the pry for making an eddy turn in rapids. The paddle can be kept close to the surface to avoid catching a rock. The crossbow draw landing. On a difficult shoreline, the bow paddler positions the stern for easy access to the landing. To side slip or move the canoe laterally, the bow and stern do opposite strokes. The bow a pry, the stern a draw. To go the other way, the bow does a draw, the stern a pry. The sculling draw does the same thing, but with more stability. The paddle remains in the water. As an alternative to the pry, the bow can do a cross bow draw. Side-slipping under power increases the degree of difficulty. Side-slipping to shore avoids broadsiding onto a shallow rock. upstream end of the canoe must touch shore before the downstream end. Otherwise, the current will swing the canoe around out of control. It doesn't look too bad. In a current, the canoe is side-slipped at an angle with the stern paddler leading the way. Side slipping away from the bow paddler's side. The bow a pry, the stern a draw. As momentum slows, a series of pries falls. The stern paddler does the sculling draw. of the pry, the crossbow draw can be used. The stability of the canoe can be increased by leaning the weight out on the paddle in a flat brace, or a high brace. As momentum slows, the paddle sinks, so must be sculled to keep it up on the surface. The paddle acts like an outrigger on each side of the canoe, a very stable position for running rapids. The standing position improves the view ahead in shallow water or when approaching rapids. The paddle is kept in the water and sculled to provide balance and steerage. When approaching rapids, standing increases the visibility over the brink. The kneeling canoeist braces for extra stability. The improved view makes it easier to appraise the rapids and line up on the deep water if they are to be run. If there is any doubt, the rapids are viewed from shore. It's possible to know where the rocks lie 
and where the safe passage is, if any, by observing the surface. It's called reading the rapids. It will be dealt with in the next film. The backwater, one of the most important strokes in modern rapid running techniques. The stern paddler draws or pries the canoe in the desired direction, while the bowman follows with reverse J's, diagonal draws and pries to control his end. The backwater and backsculling makes it possible to move slower than the current to buy time to maneuver and choose the course. Take slow, Paul. Okay, over the right. A little harder. How's Let me that? get my end over. Good, the angle's about right. Keep her going. Draw. By combining a backwater with a draw or pry, it is possible to ferry the canoe across the river. To do this maneuver properly, the canoe must not ride deeper in the stern. The canoeists work as a team, being careful not to outpull each other. When the canoe is in position, the downstream run begins. We have to hang tight to the right until we're about halfway down, then we have to back to the left. The ability to maintain complete control of the canoe by means of the many paddle strokes makes it possible to venture down rivers that would be otherwise dangerous. Paddling in waves, the canoe can be stabilized by moving into the center, where it is three feet wide instead of only a foot and a half near the bow and stern. The unweighted bow and stern bobs easily in the troughs without shipping water. In lake travel, one is almost sure to encounter large waves at one time or another. By practicing with an onshore wind and good life jackets, a wipeout would only mean a swim to shore. Relax and lean into the waves, not away from them. As in rapids, it is necessary to read the water and memorize the shoals where only the big waves break. A breaking wave is about the only thing a canoe can't ride. It would be very dangerous to try this off a point where an upset would result in being swept out into a large expanse of water. It's much better to learn the art of paddling in wind, waves and rapids in a controlled situation than to try to learn when things get difficult unexpectedly on a canoe trip. base of these cliffs, weary voyageurs once stopped to rest and smoke their pipes as they paddled and sang their way along the shore of Superior. There 
their 40-foot canoes of birch bark were the ancestors of the wide variety of canoes we know today. The modern-day voyageur is faced with a bewildering array of canoes from which to choose. The problem is how to pick a good one. The canvas-covered cedar canoe, only one generation removed from the small birch bark canoe of the Indian, is still the most aesthetically pleasing canoe of all. Aluminum and fiberglass canoes are best suited for those who are mainly interested in a no-maintenance functional canoe. Some models with their flat bottoms are very safe, but lack in the aesthetic qualities. Some of the best designs are to be found in the canvas cedar canoes, like this Prospector model. Five meters is an average length. A slight rocker to the keel line makes for fast pivot turns in rapids. A continuous curve to the gunwale from bow to stern is desirable. Gunnels that drop too soon allow waves to spill in over the bow. A cross-section of this canoe reveals adequate tumble home. That's the sloping in of the gunnels near the top, necessary for easy relaxed paddling. To provide adequate freeboard with an average load, the canoe should be 91 centimeters wide amidships and at least 35 centimeters deep. The cedar canoe is, it must be admitted, heavier and more fragile than the aluminum, fiberglass, and plastic canoes. Gone is the beautiful curve of the gunwale of this battered and patched old canvas-covered canoe. Every cracked rib and broken plank, a reminder of past adventures. is more than just a means of getting around on water. It is a link with the past. And when you paddle a canoe, you journey with those who have gone before.